Yeah, so so uh, Dr. Bowles is going to tell you about uh, uh, linking into behavior and, and asking this question, um, you know, do these pathologies that I've just shown you, do, do they produce changes in behavior? Uh, or, or if not, are there other explanations for why we see changes in animal behavior? David. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good morning. Um, okay, so as uh, Richard said, the, the aim of this presentation um, is really to introduce the, uh, the discussion point that effects other than neurological may also impact on an animal's behaviours. Um, much of the data I'm going to present in this talk um, focuses on a study we've performed at the University of Plymouth looking at effects of um, titanium dioxide nanoparticles on rainbow trout. Um, but hopefully, and as Richard has introduced, with the aim of stimulating the discussion as to whether we think these effects are relevant to other classes of um, nanomaterials and, and also for other animals, including humans. Okay, so, so one of the things we're, we're especially interested in Plymouth um, is, is to focus on uh, bioenergetic responses um, to, to nanoparticle exposures. Um, just to give some, uh, some of the, the fundamental principles to, to bioenergetics, um, all animals must function within their energy budget. Um, the energy available to, to, um, to an animal is finite, um, and how an animal uses this energy can be uh, visualized in, in a very simple um, bioenergetic model, which is, which is what we have here. Um, so a proportion of the, the daily energy expenditure by an animal will be spent on um, vital physiological functions. Um, so these are essentially the processes which, which keep the animal alive, so um, the action of the heart, um, uh, the function of uh, uh, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and, of, of, of course, the activity of the central nervous system. Uh, and this is commonly referred to as the, the standard metabolic rate of an animal when it's at rest. Uh, remaining energy um, is then available for use in locomotion, and, of course, this is particularly true for active animals. Uh, and often the, the energy expended on locomotion, or the locomotion itself, uh, is often what we define as an animal's behavior. Um, uh, and remaining energy can then be spent um, for use in growth, the production of gametes, um, or as storage in, in energy reserves. Um, and importantly, when we look at bioenergetic responses to um, all contaminants, um, an important parameter to, to look at specifically is the relationship between the energy expenditure on the standard metabolic rate and remaining energy uh, within the energy budget, and this ratio we refer to as the metabolic scope of an animal. So why might um, nanoparticle exposures be uh, relevant to bioenergetics of an animal? Well, um, upon uh, exposure, what we might expect is that uh, energetic costs um, of dealing uh, with these particles might increase. So this is processes involved in um, detoxification or perhaps tissue repair. Um, and, of course, the consequences for the animal will be that as the uh, costs of the standard metabolic rate increase, um, metabolic scope is reduced and there's less energy available um, for locomotion, so activity or these behaviours, um, or the production of gametes. So uh, there's effectively an energetic trade-off within the animal's energy budget. And, of course, the, the animal must sacrifice um, uh, either activity or, or partition of energy to elsewhere to deal with the contaminant. Um, and we already have some evidence uh, to suggest that nanoparticles might impair reproduction um, in animals. This is a, uh, some data from um, one of Richard's PhD students at Plymouth, Chris Ramsden. Um, and what Chris did is he um, exposed uh, zebrafish, adult zebrafish, um, to 1 ppm of titanium dioxide nanoparticle and looked at reproductive output as um, numbers of viable embryos they produced over a, a, an exposure period of about 18 days. And what Chris found is that uh, the black line here, this is exposure to um, the, the nanoparticles or the, uh, the material control, the bulk material here, is what Chris found is that, that uh, reproductive output was significantly reduced in these fish. And, of course, the, the importance of this can't really be overstated in that a chronic, um, what we'd expect would be a chronic level effect uh, for the individual can, of course, have quite an impact, a heavy impact on, on the population as a whole if uh, reproduction uh, decreases. Of course, what we don't know in a study like this is whether these effects are um, on the energy budgets of the fish, 
um, or perhaps some other behavioral response to, to the nanomaterial. Um, and a better way for assessing um, energetics in, in active organ, organisms, um, and in particular in fish, is, is to look at locomotion, because uh, it's, it's locomotion where there is um, uh, uh, the main energy expenditure of the, if, from the energy budget. Um, so this is a slide taken from a, a, a paper published in the 1970s, uh, which explored the, the theoretical relationship between activity level in trout and, and the potential for mortality. Um, and I've included this slide really to emphasize the fact um, that animals spend much of their time operating within their metabolic scope. Um, so the, on the x-axis here is the metabolic rate, so this is, would be the standard metabolic rate uh, relative to the scope. So the animals function within the limits um, of their metabolic scope. Of course, as activities uh, increase, they demand high amounts of energy, the potential for mortality will increase. Um, so what we might expect um, upon a nanoparticle or a contaminant exposure is that this curve may shift to the right as energy expenditure to deal with uh, the contaminant increases and therefore the potential for mortality uh, is more of a risk. So what we might expect is for fish to reduce um, energy expenditure on um, locomotion. Uh, and this is what we've seen before um, in some exposures to some more traditional um, pollutants such as um, copper as copper sulfate. Um, so this is a, a paper from Hamish Campbell who was also in the lab uh, a number of years ago now. And what Hamish looked at um, was activity levels in rainbow trout fed diets containing um, copper sulfate. Um, I should say that trout um, uh, exhibit uh, diurnal rhythms in their levels of activity. This is actually um, uh, day and night uh, within the exposure and these fish are particularly active at dusk um, during the night uh, and especially at dawn um, and what Hamish found is that um, levels of inactivity in, uh, in fish fed the diets containing copper was, was greater um, uh, and also that the time spent traveling at high velocities uh, these bars represent um, the speed of various movements and the time spent traveling at these velocities. Um, and these high velocities of uh, movements of over 20 centimeters per second. He found that uh, in fish fed the diets containing the copper, uh, the amount of time spent traveling at these high velocities was significantly reduced. So it suggests that the fish are reducing energy expenditure due to the, uh, the effect of the exposure. Another interesting finding from the paper is uh, that, that dietary copper actually upset the circadian rhythms um, in these fish. So activity levels change during the day for trout. Um, and uh, on the, the y-axis here, this is just simply a, a different metric for activity level. This time distance swam um, percentage increase over, over uh, baseline activity in these fish. Um, the black dots are the fish for the control diet, the, uh, the grey triangles are um, fish for the diets containing copper. And, and of course what we'd expect to see is this nice um, wave-like uh, line of best fit for, uh, for, for control fish with high levels of activity um, uh, at dawn and dusk and through the evening. I should say that the time here doesn't represent um, uh, time during the day actually represents time during the exposure. Um, so there's this kind of pattern here with circadian rhythm of over 24 hours um, if fish fed the control diets. Um, but for fish fed the, the dietary copper, there's still indications of a, a diurnal rhythm, um, but it's much less pronounced. So hopefully with, um, with these introductory si uh, slides, it, it's uh, put across the idea that um, bioenergetic effects may also um, affect behaviors of fish. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is a particular experiment <coughs> excuse me, um, where we've looked at the, the effects of titanium dioxide nanoparticles and activity levels in fish. Um, of course, how do we do this? Uh, this is a slightly out of date with a floppy disk um, schematic showing uh, our tracking system we have in the aquarium at Plymouth. Um, so what we have is a series of um, floor-mounted boxes um, uh, where individual fish are put into these chambers and allowed to, to acclimate to the conditions. Basically, they're left uh, undisturbed for a number of hours. 
Uh, and then above these boxes, we have a series of um, ceiling-mounted video cameras. Uh, and the, uh, the tracking software that we use, the EtherVision software, um, it detects uh, the position of the fish six times a second based on the contrast of the fish to its background, records this as a, the position as a series of XY coordinates, and then, of course, um, from this positional data, um, uh, we can look at parameters such as the, the speed of, uh, of, of various movements and, of course, the, the, uh, the total distance moved by the animal. So just to give you some quick bit of information about the experimental approach, um, we used uh, juvenile rainbow trout. So these are sexually immature uh, fish, so they shouldn't be partitioning any uh, energy, energy to, um, to the production of gametes. Um, and we exposed them for a period of 14 days to uh, one milligram per litre of titanium dioxide nanoparticle or the bulk material. So this is a large particle. This is a material control. Um, and we used a, a semi-static test system uh, with twice daily 80% water changes. Um, and the, the reason for the water changes is to, to go some way to keeping the titanium dioxide in suspension because you can see this... Um, rapid uh, the, the aggregation and the, uh, and the settling out of the particles, um, but also to uh, maintain good water quality for the fish. Um, during the exposures, fish, fish were fed only twice. Um, the, the reasons for this are, are twofold, um, and this was done prior to redosing. Mainly it's because we, we, want to ex we wanted to expose the fish via the gill. Um, of course, we don't want um, the titanium dioxide to become associated with um, the diets fed to these fish and have a dual um, exposure or dual exposure routes. Um, and also because uh, changes in an, in an animal's uh, energy budget uh, might be more pronounced if the fish are fed a minimal ration. Um, and then um, at day 14 of the exposure, um, we've taken tissues to look at the distribution of titanium um, performed morphological observations of the tissues. Um, I've also included a, a, some biomarkers of a, um, that we've looked at, in, including markers of uh, oxidative injury. There's some in vitro data to suggest that um, uh, titanium dioxide generates um, free radicals of reactive oxygen species. Um, and we also uh, performed our various behavioral assays. So I won't dwell on this too much, just to say that the, the particles, the nanoparticles and the bulk material are of different sizes, as you'd expect, uh, uh, and the aggregate size distribution is, is different within our stock suspensions. Okay, so that's, that's how the, the exposure was performed. Um, uh, and this is the, the profile of titanium accumulation um, in various tissues of the fish. So... Um, the titanium is, is what we'd expect to be, actually, as, as titanium dioxide. Uh, and what we observed was a, um, the accumulation of, of both the bulk materials, this is a light grey bar, and, and the nanoparticle is the dark grey bar, um, accumulation of the gills of these fish compared to the controls. Um, we didn't see any, any accumulation of the intestine, so um, by not feeding the fish, perhaps we prevented this, these dual exposure routes. Um, but we didn't see any accumulation at the, the kidney, the liver, um, and, and titanium wasn't consistently detected in the brain. So, so this kind of verifies the exposure. These, these fish were exposed to, uh, to quite high concentrations of titanium, um, uh, and it seemed to accumulate at the gill. So moving on to, to the behaviour, so how, how might this affect the behaviour of these fish? Um, so the left-hand panel here is, is the total distance moved of these fish, and the fish were tracked for a, for a period of about three hours um, just after the, the lights went on in the aquarium. Um, and, and these fish are reasonably active. In a three-hour period, they may move anywhere up to about six or 800 metres. Um, so so they're, they're quite lively in the, in the chambers. Um, and what we found is that there was no significant difference when we looked at this data as a whole. So this is total distance moved over the three hours, although there's a trend, of course, within the data to suggest um, that the nanoparticle exposed fish are moving less. Um, a related statistic in the right-hand panel is the, the velocity of these movements. Um, but, of course, again, we didn't see that there was any significant difference between the groups. Um, but when we break this data down, um, uh, and we start... To, to look at the distributions um, uh, of the different activity levels of, of these fish. Um, and what we've done is um, we've split 
uh, the velocity of movements into one centimetre per second speed bin, so you'd have low velocity movements here or, or in activity and high velocity movements at, at this end and duration on the y-axis. If we just concentrate on the colours of the lines, um, fish exposed to, to the, the nanoparticles is, is the blue line here. What you can see is there's a clear, close to significant trend towards um, reduced time spent moving at, at high velocities compared to uh, control fish and also the fish exposed to the bulk material. So the question really was, okay, if there's a trend in the, uh, within the data, um, the, the data itself is quite noisy, um, what, what could be driving this? Richard's uh, already shown some information to suggest that other classes of, of nanomaterial, particularly the nanotubes, um, can induce uh, uh, gill pathologies in, in, in fish. Um, uh, and we've seen a similar thing with the, the titanium dioxide nanoparticles, and this is consistent uh, with the accumulation. Um, and, and what we've seen is that this, there's this characteristic fattening uh, of the primary lamellae in, in fish exposed to both the, the nanoparticle and the bulk material, um, and some, some secondary pathologies as well. So you end up with um, club tips, so shortened uh, secondary lamellae, some incidence of edema uh, and, and necrosis and hyperplasia in these gills. So, so there's a, there's a, a gill-mediated interaction between the particle and the fish and some associated toxicities. Um, uh, and what this, what this means for the organism, uh, for, for the fish, it is that there's some level of respiratory distress, but this was only seen in the fish exposed to the nanoparticles. So um, the concentration of, of hemoglobin in the blood um, and, and also the hematocrit, this packed red blood cell volume, um, goes up upon uh, nanoparticle exposure. Um, and incidentally, there was, there was no um, evidence for, a, for an ion or regulatory disturbance. Uh, and what this suggests is that um, there's a greater recruitment of red blood cells into the circulation. Uh, and of course, this can be viewed as a, um, a compensatory mechanism by the fish to, to increase uh, or, or to maintain um, sufficient oxygenation of, of, of secondary tissues. Um, and this is also consistent with what we see at the spleen. Um, so this is a, a nice picture on the left-hand side of what a, a, a spleen looks like from a control animal. So um, you, can, you can clearly see the, the areas associated with the, the red and the white pulp in the spleen. Um, the spleen also has a, a, some Im immune function. Um, and in fish exposed to the titanium dioxide, there's this depletion of the red pulp. So this is the, the red blood cells moving out um, or being released into the circulation. Um, as part of this, this compensatory mechanism uh, for the respiratory distress that we see. And there's also some, some incidents here of um, uh, the appearance of Milano macrophages, so perhaps mopping up um, debris uh, uh, caused by uh, uh, tissue associated with, uh, with perhaps with tissue damage. Um, and, and also following the 14-day the exposure, there's, there's some some effects are, are starting to appear for, for indications of, of systemic hypoxia. So um, if you recall the, the slide showing the accumulation of titanium, um, we didn't see any accumulation in the, in the brain or the kidney of these fish, um, but we're starting to see uh, changes in, in several uh, biomarkers for oxidative injury, um, although the effects are, are, are quite small. So in the left-hand panel here we have, um, this is uh, total glutathione in, in uh, brains and kidneys of fish, um, and there's a, a stepwise significant increase for, for fish exposed to the, the nanoparticle itself. Um, and this is also true for, for levels of lipid peroxidation in these, these organs. Um, so the, there's some evidence for, uh, for an effect taking hold within these tissues. Um, and what we've also seen is that whereas by and large the structure of the brain was um, to be considered normal within these fish, um, what we saw is that there's this fattening of um, blood vessels, especially um, around the cerebellum, um, uh, which isn't occurring within the, the control fish. 
Um, but of course, al although um, long-term consequences of exposure, if we let this go on uh, longer than the 14 days, of course, you might be in a situation where these, these blood vessels could rupture. Um, of course, this could also be viewed as a, 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 again as a compensatory response to hypoxia. So um, naturally, if, if oxygen levels in the blood decrease, um, the fish uh, increases blood flow to sensitive tissues, in particular the brain, um, to maintain adequate uh, uh, oxygenation. Okay, so that, that's, that, that's kind of uh, showed a, a number of slides um, related to uh, respiratory distress and associated effects in organs. Well, well how does this relate to movement um, and, and the, uh, the nervous system in particular? Well, despite there being increased levels of, um, of glutathione, of course, these, these mop up. Uh, reactive oxygen species and free radicals in the brain tissue. We don't see any effect on the, the activity of the acetylcholinesterase, so part of this, uh, the, the, the neuromuscular function or the, the signal and activity of the brain. Um, and there's also no indications that the um, electrophysiological potential of the muscle, muscle tissue has, has been affected by the exposure. So that kind of uh, bodes well for the fish as, uh, to suggest that, um, that certainly uh, physical, physical structures are, are being uh, protected. Um, and of course, we're, we're especially interested in looking at the bioenergetics of these fish. Um, and after the 14-day exposure, there's, there's no difference in the, the mobilization of glucose into the plasma. Um, um, and we've looked at another, uh, uh, a number of other energetic endpoints as well, and there doesn't seem to be any perturbations associated with, with energy reserves in these fish. Um, and and the, uh, the lactate also, the levels of lactate in the plasma follow um, um, the levels of activity in these fish. So there's no indications of, of greater um, uh, generation of lactate associated with, with, with lower, lower levels of activity in fish exposed to the nanoparticle. <laughs> Um, so just to sum up, an interim summary really, uh, there's been some evidence that there's, uh, there's hypoxia in these fish with associated um, uh, organ pathologies uh, uh, and the starting to uh, see some, some onsets of systemic uh, hypoxia, but of course uh, and perhaps a trend in the behavioral data to suggest uh, lower levels of activity in fish exposed to the nanoparticles. Um, but of course what these fish are lacking within this uh, behavioral system is the motivation to expend energy. Um, so one way we can look at this within uh, trout, okay. one way we can look at this within the trout is to, um, to look at the interaction between conspecifics. Fish like uh, many, or trout like many other um, active animals um, need to compete uh, for food, um, for mates, uh, and of course, what, what these types of interactions require is the rapid mobilization of energy reserves um, and also uh, a, a close and, and good functioning sympathetic nervous system uh, as part of the stress response in these fish. So how, so how do we look at um, the interaction between these fish? Well, um, we pair fish outside of their treatment groups. So um, nanoparticle exposed fish is paired with a control fish or, or um, a nanoparticle exposed fish is paired with a bulk material exposed fish. And we size match these pairs of the, these fish um, because of course the, the decision to stay in or withdraw from an interaction um, is dependent on an assessment of uh, your opponent's fitness, um, size being the first indication. So we remove this as a factor. Uh, these fish are marked with uh, a blue dye acclimated to the tanks for 24 hours, um, and, and then the barrier is removed, uh, and these fish are very aggressive. I'll show a, a short video next, um, and, and then we score this interaction by direct observation. So the numbers of aggressive acts, when these fish retreat um, so, that they, uh, so that we can determine which fish is the dominant or the subordinate. And of course, it's important to say that in, um, in, in trout hierarchies, it, it's um, the decision to withdraw from an interaction shouldn't come lightly because, of course, this will reduce um, opportunities to feed and also to mate. Um, so this is, this is kind of the interactions we look at. This is the barrier would have been moved um, somewhere in the region of 30 seconds before. And, and these fish are extremely active. So they undergo a, a 
kind of this, uh, they're feeling each other out, and, and there's a number of strikes, bites, and charges. Um, and, and what normally happens is after a, a number of minutes, um, one fish normally withdraws to the surface. So that's just to give you an idea of, of what happens um, in these types of interactions. Um, and they're normally resolved within a few minutes. Um, so, so what do we see when, when a nanoparticle exposed fish is paired with a control fish? Um, so it's this motivation to expend energy. Uh, and what we, what we don't see is, is that there's any effect on, on the exposure to the nanoparticle um, on the outcome of these interactions, be it when paired with a control fish or a bulk material exposed fish. So this is the proportion uh, of fish becoming dominant, uh, or the nanoparticle exposed fish becoming dominant. So there's, there's an even outcome within these interactions. Similarly, we, we don't see, um, uh, there's a lot of variability in the data, but we don't see any significant effects on the number of strikes by the dominant fish. And of course, uh, uh, the, the striking by a, by a trout is, um, uh, requires a very, very quick movement. So the, this energy expenditure on, on locomotion, we don't see any change uh, in the number of strikes by the fish which becomes dominant, be it a nanoparticle exposed fish or a control fish. Um, and similarly, we don't see any uh, indications of a, the, uh, of a difference in, in the time of retreat here. Um, so what this suggests, of course, is that uh, although there's a bit of variation in the data, um, the, 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 the fitness of, of the, the nanoparticle exposed fish isn't, isn't significantly reduced. So just to summarize before we move on to the discussions, um, we didn't see any significant reduction in swimming activity, but there's a trend towards reduced time spent at higher velocities in the uh, nanoparticle exposed fish. Um, there's evidence of respiratory dis distress in these fish um, and, and some subtle indicators that there's developing uh, hypoxia in the internal organs, including the brain. Um, so the question is really for, for the audience and for ourselves is, do we think these effects are likely to be relevant to, to other nanomaterials? Um, and perhaps are other animals likely to be more sensitive to bioenergetic effects um, than, than the trout? Thank you for your attention. <laughs>